Now, I don't know if you've noticed this, but we've been talking about the book of Exodus now. I think this is week eight. I think this is week eight. And we're now in our second, kind of technically third, but second week talking about the plagues of Egypt. Now, let's just be honest for a minute. Most people aren't stopping at the plagues to spend three weeks there. It's actually going to be four. (laughs) Right? Most people don't do that because the plagues are kind of scary. They're kind of weird. It's a different side of God. We're not used to seeing. We don't know if we really like it. We're still believing if it's even possible. But I am here to tell you and to remind you, I hope you've already seen this, that as we spend time sitting in God's word, we see things about him and about how he works in the lives of people that we wouldn't see if we just scanned through it because it made us uncomfortable or it was something we were unfamiliar with. You are all, I wasn't planning to say this, but here we go. You are all young people. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Some of you apparently are aging quicklier than others, and you need that. Listen, here's what I want you to hear. Listen, all of you, please listen to me. Do not be the generation that uses God's book as a self-help book when you need some help and it's the last resort, but you'll turn there to get a little bit of encouragement or to see if God can help you get through your problems. I want this book to be your lifeline, not your emergency line. It needs to be the thing that you are connected to. If you want to hear from God, open your heart to hear from him. It comes from the word. This is the place where you are going to encounter the Lord. All right, we're about to talk about emotions in a couple minutes, and and I don't think you're ready for what I'm about to tell you. I'm just being honest, and you can smile now. You ain't going to be smiling when I'm done, I promise. But I'm I'm here to tell you tonight is going to be a truth night because I need you to hear this. God wants you to hear this, and I believe he's laid it in front of us tonight. It is important. This book is your lifeline, guys, but let it be a daily thing. Let it be, if, if, if God forbid, a weekly thing, if that's all you can get, but let it be something you turn to on a frequent basis. Those of you getting ready to head into college, those of you just graduated college or starting a new career, don't just throw it aside because it got you through a small season. It is for the rest of your life, your instruction book, your navigation book. It is going to be the greatest thing you will open up if you will just give it time to wash over you. And so here we are in the plagues where no one probably wants to be, yet we're here. And I'm telling you what, I, I don't know about you, but the more I study this, the more I find God working I see things and themes I didn't see before, and he is doing something. So I hope that will encourage you. Now, we can begin, because that was not part of what I was going to say. Um, when I was growing up, I don't know about you, but my, uh, my mom used to say, uh, boy, I brought you into this world, and I can, right? So apparently y'all had that too. Um, it didn't work, because I'm still here. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> But my mom used to threaten me with a few things like that. The other thing she used to hate was if we wore our shoes on her white carpet. You didn't wear shoes on mama's white carpet or you wouldn't have feet to put those shoes on later on. I mean, there are just some things in life you didn't do. My mom was not an aggressive person by nature, but she knew how to get there when she needed to. Being a single mom of three, she knew how to handle business. Now, I tell you that because as I'm looking at the, the plagues unfold, what some people think when you, when you think of the plagues as one big piece is you look at God and you say, man, he's kind of evil. He's harsh. He's unveiling things on these people and, and they're, they're painful. We're about to see the first real painful to the person plague unfold tonight. And, and why is God doing it? Maybe God's evil after all. Maybe this is the side of God that everyone talks about that I don't want to deal with. But if you look closely, actually what you see is a patient God just slowly growing more impatient with the people. God could have opened up with plague one, and after plague one didn't work, could have just said, fine, finito, it's done, you're off, you're gone, let's replace them with someone else. He's got the power to do that. But he's patient, and he's waiting for a chance for people to respond, to repent, to turn from their evil ways and move toward him. This is the God that we are watching. And so I think a mama who used to threaten me to take me out of this world, but the truth was she always had patience with me, sometimes more than others. Let's just be honest, mom, if you're listening. But the reality is she had patience with this young man as he grew into the man that God was creating him to be. And we are watching God show that same patience through the plague. So be careful not to look at this and and maybe think God is evil or mean. God is just, but he is working and he is trying harder and harder and harder to get the attention of Pharaoh and the people 
of Egypt, not to mention Israel. By the way, which leads us into what we're looking at. These plagues are unfolding for a couple reasons. Number one, it's unfolding to get Pharaoh's attention. Ideally, to get Pharaoh to turn his heart from hard into soft and to repent. But he's also using these plagues to get a hold of the people of Egypt. That's an important aspect of this. The second thing is he's using, God is using these plagues to get a hold of the people of Israel. Because the people of Israel have kind of forgotten who he is. They've forgotten the power that God has. They've forgotten the promises and the covenants that he's made. They've forgotten who he is over this long period of time as they've been distant from him. And so God is reminding them, showing them the power that he has. And in addition to that, God is going toe-to-toe with the gods of Egypt. And we've talked about this numerous times. There are 80-plus different gods that the people of Egypt worship. And God is standing toe-to-toe with each one of them, and he is taking them out one by one as each plague unveils, which we'll look at a little bit more tonight. But that's kind of what we're seeing. This is why God is working in this, and this is why he's coming. And I want to remind you as we watch these plagues unfold and as we watch them intensify. By the way, this is roughly a uh, a seven, some believe a seven month period when it's all said and done from start to the final finish of the final play. This is a long time that this has been taking place. A lot is happening and we're watching the impatience of God slowly grow as he moves from one plague to the next. But the point here is, and I want you to see this, God is trying to be patient because in the end he has a final plan. That same principle is true for us today. God is patient with you and I, waiting for us to turn our lives over to him. Some of you already have, praise the Lord, but to turn our lives over to him, to give him, to step into salvation, and then to serve him and to follow him as he leads our life. And he's waiting patiently. Why hasn't Jesus returned? Many reasons, but one of the key ones is most likely that, giving as many of his children a a chance to respond to him. But God, at the end, is not going to play favorites. He won't do it with Pharaoh and the people of Egypt, and he's not going to do it with us. For those that are in Christ, there will be paradise waiting. For those that are not in Christ, there will be eternal hell. And I think about my daughter, and she's the cutest kid on the face of the planet. Without a doubt, there's no debate. Just close your mouth. And she, if she were to stand before God years from now and try to play the cute card, it works on mom. But it won't work on God because God doesn't play favorites. Cute faces don't get you into heaven. Sweet people, being a sweet person doesn't get you into heaven. Doing good deeds doesn't get you into heaven. God doesn't play favorites because God sees sin as sin. And so what we're seeing unfold is a beautiful reminder of where God stands with you and I today. Okay, now let's begin. Enough introductions. Let's move in. So here we go. Moses and Aaron have been going in on behalf of Pharaoh, standing in front saying, let my people go. Pharaoh says no. Plague one, plague two, plague three, plague four, plague five. Now we move into plague six. Okay, so here we go. Exodus chapter nine, verse eight. We'll move through quite a few scriptures. So if you don't have your Bible, just look on the screen or look on with someone next to you. Exodus chapter nine, verse eight. Here we go. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the kiln or from the furnace and let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. This is good. It shall become fine dust over the land of Egypt and become boils breaking out in sores on man and beasts throughout all the land of Egypt. Aren't you glad you came to church tonight? Man, come on. Boils and dust, this is great. It's gonna break out in sores on man and beast and on the animals throughout all the land of Egypt. Okay, let's stop for a second, let's look at this. Couple things, God's kinda of gone in, in a series here. There's been two plagues with a warning and then a third one without. Then another two plagues with a warning, then a third one without. Translation, God's given warning, he's given hope, he's trying to help, he's trying to show you what's coming and then finally says that's it, smack. That was for emphasis, but it worked. Because our lives are that way too. God warns us through the teaching of his word. God warns us through people. And then every once in a while, he just says, okay, I love you, I love you, I love you. But listen, and we'll see if we get your attention this way. God operates in a similar way. And so we've seen two plagues with a warning and then not. Here we go with the warning without a plague. Out of nowhere, here comes this one. And did any, I don't, this, this may be wrong. But did anybody see it? Watch this. Do we have basketball fans in the house tonight? A couple of you? Watch this. Yes! Yes, he takes a handful of soot from the kiln. This is totally bad, I'm sorry. And let Moses throw it in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. Did anybody see that? Anybody? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. The ones that would get it are watching the game. I get it. All right, whatever. It's okay. I thought that was funny. That was totally not. Anyways, whatever. They will become boils. Now, what are boils? Boils are, are swellings that come up on the skin, could be on the face, could be on the body. Uh, they would be similar to burns, some say poison ivy, but they typically would come out and they would be inflamed, they would itch, they would want to scratch them. They are an extreme pain. And so as Moses, LeBron James, the dust in the air, it passed through, the, now you get it, it passed through the air and somewhere in transition it goes from dust into boils that fall on the people now remember this is important because what God's doing is using natural elements mixed with supernatural power the natural elements of the plague help us to at least get a gauge that this could be possible but the supernatural reminds us that this is all God and there is no nature to be understood he is doing that which he pleases and has the power to do so so we see the same thing it starts with just a little bit of dust in the air and then God takes it and turns it into boils this is plague number six God is moving forward this is a hurtful plague. in fact this is the first plague that actually harms people all the plagues before this have just been surrounding now we actually have harm coming upon the human body okay so it is expanding it is intensifying God's patience running less and less and these are growing but did you notice what it said I want you to take soot from the kiln or from the furnace. This is so good. The furnace, this would have been the very furnace or kilns that they would have used to make the bricks while they were in slavery. So God says, Moses, go to that thing that they were making my people work at, insane hours and impression, and I want you to take soot from that place, I want you to grab it, and I want you to throw it up, and I want you to remind them that my justice will prevail. That as they throw that dust up that you had so hard to work for, it's now gonna fall on them and it's gonna turn into boils. Listen, don't ever doubt that God's in control. Don't ever doubt, we talked about this last week, but I feel like it's important enough to say it again. If God's going to bring justice, let him do his justice. It'll be far better than anything you or I could give. That's just the reality. Get out of the way and let God be God. You'll be grateful for it. You won't have regret. And, and it probably wouldn't be nice to smile as you look at that happening. But you just trust that God's in control. That's a side note. I was free. You can have it. Now, one other thing we've been trying to do with each of these plagues is show you which God, that our God, the God, is dominating. So this God is the God, I don't even know how to pronounce it, Amhotep. That's how it sounds, so that's how it's pronounced, and we'll roll with it together and smile. The God Amhotep is the God of medicine. Now, boils, at this moment, have no cure. So the God of medicine, who keeps all the people safe and healthy, has just been demolished because now boils rain on all of the people of Egypt and there's nothing that they can do. And all throughout the way we have seen God not only go after Pharaoh in Egypt but to prove to them you've worshipped someone other than me. Let me show you how much power they have compared to me. He is one by one taking them out and it is absolutely a beautiful thing. And so these boils fall and they have no cure. Plague number seven. Pharaoh isn't getting the picture by the way. I decided tonight I'm not going to say that every time. His heart just continues to be hard. We move to plague seven. Verse 13. Then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and your people so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. Pause. Do you remember in Exodus 5-2, Pharaoh asked the question, who is the Lord that I should listen to his voice? And God has been responding to that question of every plague. And he reminds him, so that you will know who I am. Am and that there is no one like me on the earth. Verse 15, for by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Verse 17, you are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go. Behold, about this time tomorrow, he gets a warning again. I will cause very heavy hail to fall, such as never has been in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. 
Now therefore, send, get your livestock and all that you have in the field into safe shelter. For every man and beast that is in the field and is not brought home will die when the hail falls on them. Then whoever feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh hurried his slaves and his livestock into their houses. But whoever did not pay attention to the word of the Lord left his slaves and his livestock in the field. Did you get it? Some listened, some didn't. Well, good thing we don't do that today, right? Isn't that marvelous that we all just listen to God? Oh, we don't? What happened? It's the same story today. God gives us warning because he loves us. So many people see this book as a bunch of rules of things I can't do, I can't live life, I can't. But God says, no, I love you. Let me protect you from these things so that you can have fun without looking over your shoulder. That's a good idea, isn't it? Yeah, and God says, I love you so much, I'm gonna protect you. He gives him a warning. He says, look, sometime tomorrow this is gonna happen, but if you'll take all your livestock and your personnel, put them inside a house or put them inside shelter, I'm gonna take care of you. It's not gonna fall. But yet some listened and some didn't. The age old problem, in fact, the uh, revelation tells us even in the end times, even in the end times after the Christians have been taken away, people will still doubt that there's a God. Unbelievable, unbelievable how prideful and arrogant the human race is to think that even with seeing the power of God six plagues in, they would still choose not to believe. It's unbelievable to me, yet it is the nature of human and human sin. It says that hail is gonna fall. Now, y'all may be familiar with hail. We don't get as much of it around here, but we do get some balls of ice. Typically, they're balls. Who knows what the shape actually looks like by the time they hit the ground. But typically, balls of ice, they could be large, it could be small. Now, here's the thing. This wouldn't really be a normal thing in Egypt. They would have maybe experienced some of this, but the idea of a rainstorm that brought ice falling from the sky would have really been an abnormal thing for them. So you, they, again, instantly, human nature. Well, could he really do this? I mean, he did the other six things like he said he would, but maybe this will be the one that he's just blowing smoke, right? This could be the one. And so eventually they're doubting, but this is a, a big deal as we're transitioning into something they've never seen before, yet God loves them so much, he gives them the warning to Pharaoh and hopes that he will pass it on to his people. Some heed the warning and some do not. And Pharaoh's stubbornness continues to be exemplified by God's power. The stubbornness of man. Then 25, the hail struck down everything that was in the field in all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And the hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree of the field. This is their food disappearing. Verse 26, only in the land of Geshen, where the people of Israel were, was there no hail. Then Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, this time I have sinned. The Lord is in the right and I and my people are in the wrong. We're gonna get to that last verse in just a second, don't you worry. That's what we've been waiting for all night, at least I have. You didn't know it, but now it comes. So this storm unveils on the people like they've never seen before, just as God said. They're scared. Y'all been in a storm? You've seen hail, especially at night? It's scary. You hear it coming, but you can't quite make out what it is. Ice falling from the sky, at least in Texas, is not the norm. So when it does happen, you kind of begin to wonder what's going on. They're scared out of their mind. This isn't just like one or two hail falling every once in a while here and there. This would be a massive downpour of ice falling from the sky, not to mention lightning and all the things around it. And by the way, this is taking the God nut. I can't make this stuff up. The God nut, who is the God of the sky, and dismantling him in front of all of Egypt. Uh, This was your sky. God's now taken it over, and now ice is falling all around you and through you. Congratulations, you are a nobody. That's all right. (laughs) And then it says, only in the land of Geshen, where the people of Israel were, did hail not fall. And we talked about this for a couple weeks, so I don't want to harp this too much, but guys, you got to be reminded, when we walk with God, There is a protection from the things of the world that the others don't have. There is a separation that comes in the end times that others will not have. And we see that symbolism here that God is protecting and taking care of his people, watching over them. And then here it is, verse 27, listen carefully. Then Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, this time I have sinned. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in 
the wrong. Okay, now let's pause. Don't read ahead. Think about this for a second. We're in plague seven of ten, and Pharaoh says, I and my people have sinned. What's he doing? He's accepting blame, and so apparently he means it, right? Keynote, we're in plague seven of ten. Just throwing this out there, all right? Here's what happened. Here's the question. Did Pharaoh mean it or not? Was it genuine or not? Now be careful before you answer. Now I gave you the tip to let you know what's coming. But in this moment, do you think Pharaoh meant it? Indecisiveness in the room. Let me ask you a question. You're the king of a nation of people. You're the most powerful person on the planet. You have, second to God, you have control of an army and people think of you as one of the 80 plus gods. Doesn't mean a whole lot, but you're one of them. And all of a sudden, you have watched plague after plague after plague after plague unfold in front of you. You have absolutely no control. And then stuff begins to fall, ice from the sky, and you have no control. You have seen them pile on. You can only imagine what's coming next. And do you think he meant for a moment, okay, maybe I've messed this up. Here's what I think. I think he meant it in that moment. Just like when you and I were growing up and we got in trouble, it wasn't that we were in the wrong, it was that we got caught. Because we got caught, we were remorseful, we were sorrowful, we wanted mercy because we get it. But the truth was we didn't get it. In the heat of the battle, though, we were truly in fear. I believe Pharaoh meant what he said in the moment, that he saw no end to the hail, all the things that have been happening, and he believed it. Here's the thing. I believe he made an emotional response. Now, time out. Many of you in this room tonight are going to be serving this summer as an intern, serve at beach retreat, some kids camp, some whatever, all across the country, this very room. I want you to watch something. If we are not careful, we will aid into and not recognize emotional responses versus mind responses, knowledge responses, truthful responses. Listen, in the world of emotion, you can do a lot of things. Yet the next morning, it's funny how all of a sudden we're right back where we were. Sometimes that's a decision in church. Sometimes that's a decision with your boyfriend or girlfriend when you're sitting there and it's late and your emotions are running and you say, yes, let's go for it. Then the next morning you wake up and you go, why did I do that? I can't believe I did that. I cannot believe I went there. Why? Because our emotions have taken over. Many people have said, I'll do this, I'll go here. Yes, yes, yes. And it's been wrapped up in emotion, not in true intellectual thought. I believe Pharaoh, in the moment, his emotions were running wild. He saw no end. He saw no, no, no way to go forward. And so in his emotional response, he said, yes, I was in the wrong. But when he stepped back the next morning or even a few minutes later, guess what he did? He went right back to where he was. Now, for all of us, and particularly for those of you that are going to serve young people or peers or even serve up this summer, let me, let me beg of you a question that you would ponder carefully. You can't control the masses, but with the individuals you'll sit down with this summer, for those of you not serving this summer, the friends that you have, the family members that you have, the people you'll spend time with, can I beg of you that you would watch carefully? that they wouldn't get sucked up in an emotional response only. That if the emotion drives them to action that's rooted in true knowledge, fantastic. That's the reality of what we desire. But we cannot, listen guys, we are a generation already sucked up in emotion. As long as it feels good, I'll do it. And we're not thinking our facts aren't there. We are not rooted. And listen, this is what happens. We're doing, we're doing young adult ministry here. This is what happens. Hundreds of students will step out of youth ministry all across the country. 
and they will fall off from the church. They will fall off from any kind of commitment to God. Why? Some chose to just go another path, but many of them never rooted what they, what they felt into what they believed. It was simply an emotional response. And listen, in the heat of the battle, as fast as that emotion came in, is as fast as that emotion will go out. It's easy to follow Jesus when everybody's singing together. It is nearly impossible to follow Jesus when the whole world seems to be against you and you're the only one trying to stand up and do the right thing. And if it is only emotion driving you, that same emotion will be your very crutch that will cause you to stumble. But if we can use that emotion to launch us into intellectual thought and understanding of who God is, why he operates the way he does, and what it means, we will stand in the darkness, the pits, the battles, the valleys, fill in the blank, and we will not feel like all of a sudden, I'm not sure if I can do this. I'm not sure if I believe. I'm not sure if this is the right thing because what's rooted here is no longer in emotion, but rooted in the truth in which we believe. This is so important, guys. And this isn't just youth ministry. This is college, adults. You know how many 40, 50-year-olds are rolling around here thinking they're all good, but it's so emotional that as soon as the tough times come, they abandon their spouse, they abandon their kids, they abandon whatever thing they felt they were called to do because they never rooted it in truth. Listen, in your darkest moments, you are not going to feel some ooey-gooey goodness you will feel as empty as you've ever felt before. And when you hit that moment is when you know because of truth, not emotion, that this God that I'm serving is the God that I will follow no matter what. Amen. Guys, this is why. Listen. This is why our generation is in so much trouble. Is in so much trouble. Our emotions are a gift from God. I thank him for them. They launch us into places that we don't know. In fact, gentlemen, did you know that you have so much adrenaline? That's why guys are so competitive. You ever wonder why they're like, they're always competing and the ladies are just like, can we just not have flowers? I'm kidding. That was, that was harsh. There's so much adrenaline in guys that when they get themselves in a situation that requires them to stand up, most of them, there's this natural human thing that happens where adrenaline overflows them so that they can step in because men are called to step in when everyone else is stepping out. God's pre-wired us that way. All right, so we see all of these things and we can see how important this is. So I just beg of you that you might think of that going forward that when you sit down with the student this summer that you won't look at them and go man they really love that song they're saying that that song has changed their life that song opened the door but only God is going to change their life and if we don't dig there and if we don't ask those tough questions look, some of you may need to do that tonight you mean to step back and make sure well, I follow God even when it doesn't feel good? Is my commitment there? Is it based on truth or is it just based on the things? Because when we become a Christian, oftentimes you start off feeling good. Things are good. Things are good. Satan does that on purpose. Give him a little bit of leash. Let him think they got it. And then whap, snack you back. I want y'all to be careful. And I, here's the thing. I'm, te I'm talking to you not as the people that I think are a victim of this, though I think some of us need to investigate this tonight before we go. But I'm talking to you as a generation that I believe is stepping out in front of these people to say, let's rally together, and I want to lead them in the right way. I want you to lead them in the right way. This is that important of a topic that we've got to deal with. So we're ready. And for those of you that aren't going to be out serving or whatever, you're going to, listen, you are always serving the Lord. Every person we encounter, every conversation that we have, God's placed us there for whatever purpose and reason. We get to be a part of this. All of us are in this. I want us to be the guys leading the way. There may only be a handful of us, but we're going to lead the way and pray that everyone else will follow. And they're not following us. They're following us as we follow him. By the way, ladies, side note, that's what marriage looks like. All right? You're not submitting to some bozo because God told you to submit. 
You're submitting because you found a man that you believe will follow the Lord and you trust him so much that you'll do whatever he says because you know he's following God. I was free too, that's marriage. (laughs) Another sermon for another day. Plague eight. Locusts. Church. If you're first time to church, man, I'm sorry. Uh, I hope you're. I, I hope you're okay. Exodus 10, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that they may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandsons how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians. And what signs I have done among them that you may know that I am the Lord. There's his phrase again. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country and they shall cover the face of the land so that no one can see the land and they shall eat what is left to you after the hail and they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field and they shall fill your houses and the houses of all of your servants and of all the Egyptians as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen. From the day they came on earth to this day, then he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Now, we jump ahead. We know the locusts come, okay? I'm just reading you parts of this, so we're not reading all three chapters in one night. Locusts, okay? This is, uh, we don't get to see very many of those here. I'd be grateful for that, by the way. Uh, these, though, come in droves, okay? How locusts work is when they come, they come in an army, And they come all together. They're driven by the wind. So if the wind was strong, they could cover up to 60 miles in a day. If the wind was light, they could cover up to a mile. Somewhere in that range, from one mile to 60, that's how fast locusts spread. When they come, they eat everything that's green and then some. So whatever vegetables, whatever plants, trees, whatever had been left after the hail, which there wasn't a whole lot, the locusts came in and were the final touch. The locusts removed any other greenery. Can you imagine being the king of a nation of people and all the plants and veggies and trees that you got are going to be gone? Okay, this is talking about dominating power against Pharaoh. And we see this, it says something very interesting. It says that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandsons how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians. God is making a statement, not just for Pharaoh, the people of Egypt, the people of Israel and the gods of Egypt, but also a statement so strong that maybe it's possible that people might still be talking about it thousands of years later. Here we are, by the way. That's the kind of statement God's trying to make. And he's telling Pharaoh, again, another warning. I'm bringing this to you. I'm giving you a chance. But if you do not do this, if you do not let my people go, this is what will fall, and it eventually falls. There's a question, though. It says, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? How long? Here's the thing, guys. Life is full of ups and downs, right? Anybody hear that for the first time tonight? Okay. Ups and downs. We're on a roller coaster ride, even as Christians. But before Christ, that roller coaster ride probably had much bigger dips than it does now. We're on a ride. And for every man and woman that has to deal with this question of who is God in their life, the true question is, how long, how stubborn are you going to remain until you see what God has in front of you? A loving God who sent his son Jesus that you celebrate whether you choose to or not every Easter and every Christmas. Sending this loving son that you might have a way to be reconnected with the God that created you. How long will we wait? The same question posed for Pharaoh is the same question posed for you and I. And you can't ask this question up. Now, some of you are believers. Praise the Lord. You've dealt with this. But for those in here that haven't, this is your question tonight. How long will you wait? This past Friday, I 
had a privilege and a great challenge to lead a funeral for a friend of some of you in this room. A young man took his life by gunshot age 25, 26, two weeks before he graduated college. And as I'm thinking through the people that love him, the people that will be there, the people that I know and love and want to lead and guide well in these moments, the only thing the Lord would allow me to think about is, Chad, this room will be filled with 250 people when the time came, with people that are possibly willing deal with this question how tough it is that it requires our darkest moments for us to deal with this question but how marvelous that a patient God would wait and take the moments in front of us and use them for his glory how long will you wait what will it take The loss of someone you love? Cancer? The loss of whatever opportunity at school you had? You gotta come home and start over? What will it take for God to grab a hold of you? For you to get that he loves you? And that he's not here to punish or to discipline or to make make you hurt. That's not his desire, but because he loves you, he'll allow whatever needs to happen so that he might grab your attention before it's too late. You see the mercy wrapped in all of this? And here, through Moses, God is saying to Pharaoh, we're eight plagues in, bro. I added, bro. We're eight plagues in. How long? How long are you going to wait? Here's the thing, guys. Some of us have some people in our lives that God has placed us there for. I'll ask you a variation of the question. How long and how much is it going to take for you and I to take those appropriate steps to open the door that they might see and know the truth that sits in front of them? Maybe it's at work, maybe it's at school, maybe it's in your family. How long will we wait? Because as we found this week, we truly don't know. Verse 8, so Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh and said to them, go serve the Lord your God. But which ones are to go, Moses said. We will go with our young and our old. We will go with our sons and daughters and with our flocks and herds, for we must hold a feast for the Lord. But he said to them, the Lord be with you. If ever I let you and your little ones go, look, you have some evil purpose in mind. No, go the men, go the men among you and serve the Lord, for that is what you are asking. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Listen, Pharaoh... If you remember last week, he has made exceptions. He's tried to cut deals. First, Moses wanted to take all the people and leave. Pharaoh came back. Hey, okay, how about you just worship God within Egypt? Then next he said, okay, how about you step just outside of Egypt but stay close enough where we know where you are? And now he's saying, okay, you want to take everybody, but how about you just take the men and y'all go worship God and then you can come back. And now this is interesting because uh, you laugh because actually this wasn't uncommon. See, in this time, worship was typically led by the men and the women and children just kind of followed along. So Pharaoh says, look, I'll meet you in the middle. You really just need the men to go worship, so take them out there, and you come back for your wife and kids. Now, the point was everybody would get to go. But Pharaoh, a.k.a. Satan working through Pharaoh, is trying to cut deals, just like he does in each one of our lives. Try to cut a corner. Try to twist the truth of God. Try to find a way to maneuver himself in there. And here we go again. Now, I'm going to use this to launch us into something very different. But it's important. We don't live in this culture anymore. Ladies, you are 
just as important as the men. Congratulations. Be encouraged by that. I mean that. I mean that. I don't know why I said congratulations. I mean that. (laughs) And when you get married one day, no matter how soon or long that is from now, I know some of you are patiently waiting. Some of you are impatiently waiting. This moment is for you. When you get married, one of the greatest gifts you're going to have, gentlemen especially, one of the greatest gifts you will receive is that wife. Scripture says you have found a good thing. That is a moment that will last forever. Praise the Lord. And I'm telling you, when you're married, you are going to be able to talk about things you've never talked about before. You will have a safety net. You will be able to deal with things. You'll be able to talk freely. Be careful. They do hit sometimes. Just kidding. But you'll be able to talk freely. I mean, there are things that you are going to experience, and it's going to be marvelous. But I want to take this caveat to tell you something important. Until you are married you don't need to divulge all that information now of course I'm talking about the physical in case you didn't pick up on that as part of what I'm saying but we're beyond those days do not have sex before you get married is that clear everybody got it okay that's what scripture says you can do that now you've heard that here's what I'm telling you one step further one problem we have and I can only speak to our generation because it's the one I know the most one problem we have is some of you meet for the first time. Oh, when you're in so much love, it's just unbelievable. You walk down the streets and flowers are like blooming as you walk and you see two doves flying together and you just see yourself floating into eternal paradise with your loved one. It's just amazing. And, and you get so excited that that first conversation, which should have been about five minutes, turns into be about five hours. And then next thing you know, you're falling asleep on the phone to see who could stay up the longest because you love each other so much. And I want to tell you something. Listen, listen. When you, when you share those kind of details, listen, you can only talk for so many things for five hours, and eventually you start getting to some meat or some good stuff, some of you might say, but I want to beg of you to reconsider this. Because here's the thing, you learn everything you can about this one person. And then here's the news flash. This is so good. You probably never knew this before. 99.9% of all dating relationships fail. This is a great church. This is so encouraging. (laughs) Plagues and failure. Now do the math. Why would he say this? How dare he? I'm sitting next to my boyfriend. How dare you say that right now? Listen. I know you're here. It's all right. I forgive you. It's great. You only marry, in our, in our world, in our desire, you only marry one person. That means all those relationships that you've had, they've fallen apart. That's okay. It's great. You learn from it. But I'm telling you, can you imagine? Listen, here's the thing. I don't, I did not want to. I already have married her. I've already stood at the altar. I did not want to stand at the altar, look across and see my wife, Sarah, and say, I cannot wait to learn all about you. And her be like, me too. But I just want to let you know, there's been about five other guys that have learned every single intimate detail about me before you. But whatever new stuff comes, I'm going to share with you. How does that sound? Is that exciting? No, it's not. Now listen, I know for some of us who are like, wait a minute, we'll back the trainer, bro. We've already gone way too far. Like, I, what do I do about this? Because it's too, I mean, I get it. I was there too, okay? I, I, was, I was a victim of this and I wanna, I wanna beg of you. I wanna help you. I wanna help you, okay? The greatest gift you'll have is to be able to discover about each other as you move forward in life. And, and let's just be honest, until you put a ring on it, until you are engaged and you are making the, you gotta be careful. That doesn't mean you don't talk. I'm not saying that, but I want you to be careful. I want you to protect parts of your life. Yes, physical, but also the, the details, the intimate details, the knowledge, the experiences. That bozo doesn't need to know all that stuff. That's not for him. That's for the one. And until he's the one, it ain't for him. You gotta, you gotta protect yourself. How special, though, would it be to be able to sit down and say, let me tell you something I've never told anyone. Are you kidding me? 
Are you, I mean, the ladies' hearts are dropping. Let me tell you something I've never told any girl before, and it not be a lie. I mean, how incredible would that be? Folks, listen, I just want to encourage you with a thought that you may have never heard of before, you may dislike, because apparently I'm not allowed to give dating talks because my dating are, talks are so good that people get mad. I mean, that's just the truth. They are so real and so truthful that y'all don't even come to advice from me anymore when it comes to dating. I'm just, the truthful part I might have added. I get it. I totally get it. But listen, I want to tell you the truth because I want to help you and I want to protect you. I want to guide you well. Now, this was an offshoot that most people would be truly offended that we went down. But when I think about this separation of, of the husbands from their wives and their kids, as a married person, we could go all day about the value of this and worshiping together, but that's not where we're at. So I want to talk to us where we're at. Can I just encourage you to think about that a little bit? Just to process what that means. How I can protect myself, both physically, but also with the intimate details of life. That if they are the one, I got a list of things I can't wait to share with you. But until you're the one, you don't get access to this, buddy. You don't get access because I care that much about the one. Don't get ahead of yourself. Protect yourself. What a marvelous day that would be. Genesis tells us I've made a helper fit for him. Look forward to that day, but don't get... Don't get succumbed by it. Just trust God's power and timing and plan and be ready to honor each other when that day comes. That's a great segue into a new dating series coming soon. Um, I don't know when it's going to be, but coming soon. Let's finish really quick. Plague number nine, darkness. It's our final plague for tonight. Exodus 10, 21. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the people of Israel had light where they lived. Now this is phenomenal. First of all, if we were granted the gift of darkness for three days, I think every one of us would be a different person. Some it would be a good thing. Some would be a bad thing, but every one of us. Could you imagine if you had no phone, no internet, no person calling you, no person bothering you, no person looking at you. You had complete silence and darkness to just sit with God. I'm telling you, you might get a lot of answers to life, those questions answered in those three days. That's the reality of the world we live in. We're so distracted, we're so busy that we don't hear from God. What a moment. But that's not what this is about. That was a side note. And so here they are for three days in pitch darkness. I mean, you gotta, I was gonna turn the lights off and then I thought I might take it too far and you'd freak out. <laughs> just go home tonight and put yourself in a pitch dark closet just for a minute and say for three days without their choosing, this is what they experienced. Guys, this is scary. This is, this is scary. And so here they are, and it says, listen to this, and this is, this is the last part, and then we'll get out of here. A darkness to be felt. Don't overlook that word. A darkness to be felt. Do you feel darkness? Have you ever thought about that before? Maybe, maybe not. Here's what I think. I, I started to look into this, and I think this is fascinating. If darkness, okay, Genesis tells us that God is what? God is light. Okay, God is light. One of the many things God is, but God is light. So let's just say for a minute, when the darkness came, a darkness that they felt, could it be possible that the darkness they felt was actually the absence of God? Not just the absence of God in the heart, but the absence of God in every aspect of life for three days. How about that for scary? It could be possible that it wasn't a light thing at all. It was completely a presence of God thing. So let me ask you a question. By the way, the sun god Ra just got destroyed too. <laughs> for the record. Here's the other part. Everyone in Egypt experienced the darkness except for who? people of Israel. Now, we don't know if that's artificial light like candles and things that, that God gave them 
the power to be able to use because the people of Egypt could not. There was complete darkness. No candles, no fire, no nothing. Or is it possible that the people of Israel were experiencing the presence of God? Possible. Let's use this to segue into a close. I actually had like five more things I wanted to say, but I'll stop. Are you, are you in darkness today? Yeah, yeah, sure. We got lights, sure, sure. You've got life, sure. But are you in the darkness that is the absence of the presence of God? We know that God is all around us. Part of why I believe this, this could definitely be the case. God's all around us. He is in the world. He's in the nature. This is how we know he's there. This is how people that have never heard the gospel, gospel can experience God because God is everything around us, the creator and all. But inside of you and I, until we open the door, right? My heart, your home. Until we open the door for God to come in, we live in darkness internally. Are you in darkness tonight? I just want you to think about that tonight. Are you in darkness? Is your life missing the presence of God? That's a deep question. God gave a beautiful symbol for the people of Egypt to experience for a moment what it would be like to not have the presence of God. And if that's you tonight, I just pray that you would think about that and that you might deal with that. Because here's the thing. As we figured out through our little message here, Life doesn't get perfect when we become a Christian. That's not how it works. But life is far better. Because now you have the power of God, not only around you, but in you, helping you walk through the darkness. And helping you to find the moments in life that God's created you to be a part of. The problems in the world that God's created you to solve. It's a beautiful thing. And I just pray, I pray that none of us might miss that tonight in case there is anybody out there. It's an important question that you and I have to deal with.